page. Um, somehow I thought there were more questions than this, but I'll check into that um, later. Uh, so, <clears throat> Looks like we've got questions from Pablo and uh, Arda, and Pablo is here. Arda, Arda, Arda can't join us today, he said, and uh, one of his, yeah, I'm not, yeah, due to the time differences, okay. All right. Well, Pablo, let's start with, uh, uh, one of your questions here. Hi, hi. So welcome. <laughs> All right. All right. So it's your first time on uh, one of these Q and A's. Uh, I, I hope that we see you more regularly. Yeah, uh, I hope so. I hope so. All right. Great. Okay. So let's see what. Um, Okay, so you consider yourself to be stage four. Um, have a lot of gross distractions. Um, having trouble find your finding your meditation object. That that uh, yeah, that will certainly make it a lot more difficult. Ah, you say, I find myself overwhelmed by this turmoil of really violent contractions and pressures. Uh, now, I assume that's feelings of contractions and pressures in your body or uh, some other sort. Uh, I think I say later there, on, it's here on the front of my face, on my nose, my eyebrows, okay. the right. bridge so of my nose, my forehead. It's sensory, good, okay. Uh, emotionally yeah. charged with frustration, mental noise, and fogginess and confusion. And it also feels as if all this area is numb, blank, as if physically impossible to sense the sensations of the breath. I believe this is due to a really intensive surgery I had in this area of my head when I was a newborn baby. Um, and the therapist believes this created a it would, it would create a huge trauma, especially in a newborn. Uh, may have something to do with PT. Yes, that's difficult to say quite yet, but we'll look at that. Um, and uh, in parenthetically, you ask if you should be reading stages five and beyond, even though you're still at stage four. And I would say, uh, yes, you should. Uh, don't overwhelm yourself. Don't confuse yourself. But you should you should have a reasonable idea of what's happening as you move along. Um, you might, um, as far as the, I, I think if you're at stage four, it's well worth reading stage five and stage six, so you have a pretty clear idea of where those first six stages are going. You might just read the uh, fourth interlude, or no, sorry, the sixth interlude. That'll give you a kind of an overview of what the latter part is about. Just read it, uh, just, just skim over it to get an idea of what's coming in the later stages. But don't, uh, don't, don't, you don't need to read it very closely. But you should have a pretty good idea of what stage five and pretty six, and stage six is about, because Usually when someone's working primarily at stage four, they're also moving back and forth between stages three and five, sometimes even dipping into six. Okay. I see. That's good. So for years you've had trouble trying to overcome this. Uh, and I, I think you're referring to the physical and emotional sensations in your face. Yeah. The time to find a state of calmness, basically, also, yeah. 
Okay, so uh, yes, I think you have pretty clearly uh, identified what is most likely the source of this, which is that uh, uh, infant trauma. Now, I just like to ask you, prior to stage four, uh, how well were you able to follow the sensations of the breath of the nose? Could you feel them then? Um, not really. That's basically been the um, constant struggle. I remember when I started meditating for almost two years, I just didn't know what I was doing because I, I, I didn't know what I was supposed to look into. I, okay. I didn't just, I never found it. It's been uh, after I did a 10 day retreat, after doing a Goenka Vipassana retreat, that I finally found my breath for the first time. And that was like a few years into the journey of meditation. So, okay. So, without having a stable meditation object, it's amazing that you got to stage four. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, I guess uh, most of the progress was after the retreat. Um, cause it's when I finally could find the, the, the sensations of the breath mm -hmm. and when I could also start like purifying some really strong emotions. So after that, for the last year, I've been able to stabilize myself more regularly and kind of get into deeper, into better stable attention and more awareness of what's going on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, We'll talk about the immediate situation, but one of the things that I'm going to just recommend is that uh, that once you have a stable object of attention, that you go ahead and go back and, and work through those earlier stages again. Uh, hopefully won't take you very long, but I think with a stable meditation object, you're going to develop a, a higher quality Samadhi. You've been developing some good sati in order to get you to stage uh, stage four, but the samadhi is probably lagging behind somewhat because of the lack of a stable uh, meditation object. Have you tried uh, using the sensations of the breath in the abdomen as your as an alternative meditation object? I've tried a couple, a few times throughout the since I started, but it never kind of work for me it's something that I, I i just don't like it's too kind of far away of my it's just something that it's easy for me to it's not attractive enough as a meditation object if that makes sense um somehow the the breathing in the area of my face even though it's way more um kind of chaotic it's it just i don't know it attracts me more it's it, it basically the breath and the, my belly never worked for me as a meditation object. I don't know why. Okay. <clears throat> well, that doesn't mean you can't cultivate it as an alternative for when you absolutely can't find mm -hmm. the breath of the nose. And what you're really looking for, you can uh, just, there's several different factors. It's not as refined a meditation object as the nose by any means, but you can make it more refined by keeping in mind that you're specifically looking for sensations uh, as, as free from uh, thoughts about what you project as the cause of those sensations. Now, um, what what we would project as the cause of those sensations is that uh, as your lungs inflate and your diaphragm contracts, the, the abdomen will rise. And you know that the abdomen is rising because there are stretch receptors in both your skin and the muscles of your abdomen. And so as that stretch occurs, you, you sense it. And then when, you, uh, when the, your diaphragm relaxes and uh, uh, then the, the falling of the abdomen, likewise, there's what you mainly sense is the um, elastic recoil as, as the abdominal wall and the skin uh, relax. Now on top of that, there will usually be a sensation of your skin against uh, your clothing. 
like that's the main one that i feel like when i when i've tried i feel my clothing rubbing my belly yeah okay well that's good if that's clear then you can just focus on that alone find the most refined version as you can and just use that as your backup so that you're never without some kind of a stable meditation object when you need one okay okay but use the nose use the sensations at the nose whenever you can now the important thing and this is going to be important for a lot of things as we go along is to uh do some work on that uh trauma as an infant and the uh emotions that it elicits uh so when when that begins to arise okay and as long as you can stay with the sensations of the of the breath either at the nose or the abdomen even though there's a lot of alternating attention with those sensations and those emotions do that when the point comes that the degree of of uh, uh gross distraction that you're experiencing is is just you know it's uh it's it's making it impossible to stay with the sensations of the breath for any length of time at either of these sites then shift your attention to the sensations in 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 your face okay make that the object of your meditation ignore as much as you can the emotions at first the emotions are connected to the sensations so in a sense you're looking at the sensations but you are you're looking at the emotions but you're looking at the emotions you're looking at that turmoil inner turmoil through the window of the external sensations that you feel the pressure uh, uh and so forth that you describe are you with me you're following me yeah 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 okay i think I Now, your goal is you to look at them objectively as you know it's not it's not my face it's not my feelings of 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 pressure and so forth this is these are just feelings these are just sensations these are just sensations that are appearing in my consciousness and i'm observing those and what you're what you want to get to is a place of uh as much equanimity as you can with those sensations where you, where you can say to yourself um uh, as honestly as possible these sensations aren't pleasant but they're all right they can they could go on as long as they want to go on and and I can be all right with them you follow me yeah 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 you should be able to. you're probably already halfway there if you've been dealing with them this long anyway yeah i've tried something like that especially as you might know on the going casta retreats it's also doing- about feeling okay. sensations right that's the one that i did last year and yeah i i tried already a little bit of that the thing that i'm afraid of it's to get into strong dissociation um i had a, a few periods of just getting into this dpdr state of just kind of dissociate of myself and it's pretty scary stuff so i'm thinking yeah until um like how far should i go with this idea of completely okay. objectifying my own you, you you don't want to you don't want to get into a place of uh complete dissociation because the more you dissociate i think as you know the less you're actually experiencing those sensations you to objectively observe them is not to identify with them but to observe them closely like the analogy would be you're a naturalist in a completely new you know say you've just arrived on another planet and you're trying to understand so you're observing everything as closely as possible but it's not you it's something that you want to learn about all right so when you find yourself sort of distancing from them then that's 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 not the kind of observation objective observation that I'm talking about so all right all right and the whole idea is to get to the place where you can say okay these sensations can be there in my face while i'm trying to 
follow the meditation object and that's all right. Now let me move to the emotions and let me just gently approach those and see if I could come to the same place where those emotions, where I can just hold those emotions. And what, could you describe the emotions that you feel? Well, at this point, they, they are not like really defined. It's just a general like frustration and anger. It's like really primal emotions. Prime um, but, emotions. But if they also have, I would say that the underlying emotion, it's a sense of desperation and hopelessness. Ah, yeah. Okay. Yes. The helplessness. Yeah, that's, that's, that, that's huge. Yeah. yeah. An infant undergoing surgery is totally helpless. An infant is pretty helpless anyway. The yeah. feeling of helplessness when things are being done to your body. So that is the core primal emotion that is driving the frustration and the desperation and everything else. Okay. So approach that gently, but explore it just as, as an emotion. You want to maintain the same objectivity, but not dissociation where, okay, what is the nature of this emotion? Um, First, really important question, a really way, a good way to get into any emotion is, is this intensity of this emotion constant? Or is it, does it sort of reach a peak and then subside and then increase again and then subside? That's always a good, good way into close examination of emotion without, uh, and you might have already noticed, you probably would have already noticed that with your facial sensations, right? So you just carry this over to these, these emotions, the feeling of frustration, all of whatever it is. And this, you just want to make friends with these emotions in the sense that, okay, it's all right for you to be there. I understand why you're there. You, you, you arose out of a very traumatic situation in my infancy and I can let you be there. It's okay. I don't have to fight against it. I don't have to let anxiety arise. I don't have to, I don't have to feel like I'm helpless because I'm not, I'm sitting here on this cushion in this comfortable place. I'm safe and you know, I am an adult and everything else. So this, that, this is bringing the, this is bringing mindfulness to this, never forgetting who you are now and where you are now. So you are, uh, powerful, young, adult, healthy, safe, and you're having these emotions and you're experiencing these emotions from the place of who and what you really are now. Holding that is going to let an unconscious processes begin to work on letting go of that infant fear and integrating it into who you are now and once that happens then this at the emotional level this will just be something that you experienced at some time i know you've experienced probably having a broken heart at some time i know you've probably experienced intense fear at some time you've, had, you've experienced all of those things but now they're just part of your history. You can recall the events and you can recall the emotions and it's, it might give you a little twinge, but it's just history. You know what I mean? Yeah. Eventually you can get to that same place with these primal emotions that came from this, uh, this uh, infant trauma. Yeah, Once so you I do, do. It's going to open up all kinds of doors in your mind. Yeah. What this is making me see now is that maybe it's such a kind of first level, like such a core emotion that I just didn't see it for what it is. Like, it's just like my, it's such a, it's like a filter where through what I see everything. So I just couldn't recognize it as an emotion. I took it as for granted completely, this helplessness feeling when I'm meditating. Um, uh -huh. Um, like I just couldn't see as this uh, as a transitory yeah. emotion as any other one because it's so kind of core at the beginning of everything of history of my own history that 
-hmm. I just took it for granted, maybe. And uh, but what I'm seeing now is how the problem is how am I supposed to when I'm sitting right and this thing arises. Since the meditation object itself is involved with the whole traumatic thing, it's hard and 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 since it's completely it becomes blank and impossible to detect sensations in here i have no place to anchor myself to kind of let the emotion flow through me so that's the thing i need to find a new anchor maybe the belly would work i need to find a new anchor for me to be able to see this frustration for what it is um do you have anything to say about that? That's exactly what I was suggesting. Have an alternative. Be able, you want to, anytime this starts to become overwhelming in its intensity, you want a way to withdraw. Now, the ultimate way to withdraw would be just to end your meditation session. But as much as possible, you'd like not to have to do that. But you mm -hmm. can do that. If it starts to become overwhelming, if you can withdraw from this by anchoring your attention on the on on the sensation to the abdomen and like i say practice this when you're not experiencing that uh, so just so that you have it as 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 a backup as kind of kind of a reserve okay i see all right and that uh, uh so we've ended up doing an intensive meditation review but uh, or a meditation interview but I'm really talking to all of you about the experience of dealing with uh, dealing with buried emotion, psychological and emotional trauma, and this is a particular intense version of it. So I thought it'd be useful to go into it. So a benefit for all of you. Uh, is, there is no point in your practice where there may not be this kind of thing that that. Uh, comes up and creates an obstacle. Most of the time that comes up is stage four and stage seven. That's very typical, but it can come up at any time as well, including after stream entry and as you progress through the path. So I just want everyone to know that, you know, don't don't feel like I'm focusing on Pablo to the to the exclusion of the rest of you, because this is going to be useful to you all eventually, sooner or later. But yeah. Do that. I think you got. I think you have the idea, Pablo. I think you were. You see yeah. where you want to go, and you're going to be amazed as you make some progress with this. The degree to which this has been affecting so many other dimensions of your life. The other thing that is really this is something that's very very deep, and when you get to the place of trying to uh, let go of that, that sense of being a separate self, you know, which is yeah. when you're in an advan advanced paths of awakening and you start to experience that, um, what's going, what's, uh, uh, you're going to be dealing with something that is even more fundamental than this, okay? So you'll have, this is all great practice. It's going to make it, okay. it's going to pay off later on, okay? <laughs> I see what you mean. All right. Yeah. yeah. All right. So this is all good. You, 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 in a sense, you're, 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 you're privileged to have this opportunity. May, may seem daunting, may seem, may make you feel discouraged sometimes. Don't let it. Okay? All right. That's One. a great fr way of framing it. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let me say hi to everyone who's arrived since uh, we started. Ayush, good to see you. Ricardo, you joined us. Um, yeah, I, yeah. Already said <laughs> said hi to Juno earlier, and uh, I'm not sure which Alex it is. Uh, there's Dermot. Um, okay, great. Well, the next question that I have here, Art has been asking this for weeks, and he's going to be listening to the recording. So uh, let's look at it. It says, uh, I feel like every micro movement one makes is filled with aversion. And as long as metacognitive awareness and joy is present, suffering is reduced. My strategy is to slow down the movements. That instantly helps me to try keep track of body awareness and joy at the same time. It stabilizes mindfulness, 
mindful awareness. I experience an instant 10 times reduction in suffering and radical increase in zonic stability of joy in my mind. But my negative impatient habits are so that I forget this often in daily life. Even as I'm typing this comment, I do feel the joy with metacognitive awareness, but I also feel this nagging urge to finish this and get this over with. I can see the aversion in those subliminal intentions, and I have okay. to work with them. Uh, what would you suggest I do? Should I continue? Uh, somebody who needs to mute their microphone. Uh, let's see if I can figure out where that sound is coming from. Could you mute your microphone, please? Thank you. I don't know where this background is coming from. I, anyway, <laughs> let me go back to, so uh, hopefully you're able to follow me by re reading along. Okay, so I feel like every micro movement one makes is filled with aversion. And as long as metacognitive awareness and joy is present, suffering is reduced. Okay, that is an expression of <clears throat> a very enhanced awareness of what is true and is going to be true, but is what you're progressively working on to diminish all the way through, throughout your practice, um, craving in the form of desire and aversion uh, will take subtler and subtler forms. And as you progress, I mean, the difference between first pass, you know, we're, let's go beyond stream entry. The, the difference between first path and second path is becoming aware of how much subtle craving there is uh, in everything that you do and, and realizing that uh, you, the only, only times you ever, the only truly satisfactory moment, you know, uh, dukkha meaning dissatisfactory. So the only dukkha free moments that you ever have are those in which there is no craving and self clinging of even the subtlest form. So what you're, what you're recognizing here is, is the reality of your situation. And what should you do is you should continue practicing, uh, and you will you will experience a series of insights, including there is a, a level of deepening of insight into the nature of suffering and craving and the relationship of those to self clinging that marks the transition from uh, first path to second path. And then likewise, the transition from second path to first path, our second path to third path is involves a recognition that even when you have let go of the uh, craving for all of the things of the sense realm, you're still left with more, still more subtle forms of craving. And likewise, from third path to fourth path. So you're on the path. That's what, you, that's what you're telling me. This is good. You say, my strategy is to slow down my movements. That instantly helps me to keep track of body awareness and joy at the same time. It stabilizes mindful awareness. And I experience an instant 10 times reduction in suffering and radical increase in jhanic stability of joy in my mind. Okay, that is good, but it's also, uh, it's, some, it's, like, it's like something that you have to get past the need for, okay? So what you're doing you, you slow down your movements, and this allows you to come into a place of joy, awareness, greater awareness, more stability, uh, and uh, your, your suffering decreases. Now, that's, that's really great. What you're doing is you are emphasizing the positive aspects of your present moment experience in order to diminish your 
uh, the the prominence of your awareness of suffering and the craving that causes it. Now that that is a that's a good strategy. You identified it correctly as a strategy. But what you really want to be doing is to be able to see to see this suffering for what it is. It is a non-acceptance. It is a it's coming from a craving for things to be different than they are, whether it takes the form of desire or aversion. It's a craving to have things different from what they are. So utilize this strategy so that you can then turn this awareness back to the aversion and, and the suffering and recognize the relationship between these and even go beyond that and recognize that that why do I want things to be different than they are? Well, it's because I believe in this story of I, you know, that I am experiencing aversion. I am suffering. And if I no longer cling to the I, then there's no longer a solid foundation for the aversion and the suffering to arrest, uh, to rest upon and to arise from. And that, that in fact, the experience of suffering and the experience of craving has the effect of reinforcing the sense of the reality of the I. So there's a feedback here. Okay. And what you want to be able to do is use your strategy to get to the place where you can just you know, much the same way I was just talking to Pablo about the, his experience, but now you're applying it, we're applying it to something subtler. And uh, so what you want to do is by being consciously aware, by even investigating with your attention, but, but in an open and observational way, not a storytelling way, not trying to explain what's happening, just seeing what's happening, you will see the relationship of suffering to aversion and aversion to self-clinging in a way that at an unconscious level, your mind will begin to reorganize and become less attached uh, in a way that produces this. So then this strategy will become less and less necessary. Uh, I wish you were here to give me some feedback, but any, anyway, any of the rest of you that would like to can. Uh, anything you'd like to ask or comment on what I the advice that I've given artists so far? Okay, well, I'll continue then. So, uh, uh, Arda, you go on to say, my negative impatient habits are so ingrained that I forget this often in daily life. Hey, yeah, that's the way it is. And the only difference is that you know it, whereas the rest of your life before this, you didn't know it. And all those other people out there don't know it. They don't realize that that they are, they are being driven constantly by uh, very deeply ingrained habits, mental habits. And that's all they are is habits. And anything, a habit is formed through uh, repetition and any habit can be unlearned. Okay. So, so this, this is wonderful. You're giving me all kinds of good news about how well your, uh, how well your practice is working. But now this gives me the opportunity of, to tell you how you can make the best use of this, which is just to recognize that, ah, this is what I'm doing is I'm seeing things as they really are. I'm seeing things as they have been all my life. I'm seeing things when I'm dealing with people and I, I can recognize how they, they're they mindless in their uh, behaviors and this drives their emotions and their actions. And I have done and continue to do the same things. You're coming from a place of wisdom, of understanding, of recognizing, the recognizing the truth of what is going on in you and in everyone. And if you're familiar with the Satipatthana Sutta, there is one refrain that occurs. I don't remember. It's 
it is the most repeated it's just repeated constantly throughout that sutta and it says i see this in myself i see this in others i see this in myself and others and so that's what you do with this you you're seeing it in yourself see it in others see and the thing is you can see things in others that you can't see in yourself take advantage of this you see it in yourself then you can see it more clearly in others and then once you've seen it more clearly in others you can see it more clearly in yourself and when you see it more clearly in yourself then it becomes more evident in others and so forth so you use you use that as a mirror to help you see more deeply into the processes that are driving you. Even as I'm typing this comment, I feel the joy with metacognitive awareness, but I also feel this nagging urge to finish the sentence and get this over with. Okay, don't think of that as I have this problem. I got, you know, it's, I'm seeing what's happening. Once I, once I can see the problem, then I'm halfway to the solution, maybe more than halfway. So observe this, say, ah, yeah, there it is. This, this feeling of urgency being driven, that's what craving's about. Craving is about, I mean, the Pali word for craving that it, the Buddha chose to use for craving is tanha, which means thirst. And think about what it's like to actually be thirsty, not just to feel like having a sip of your cup of tea or, or having, a, having a glass of water, but when you're really thirsty to the point that it's a compulsion that drives you, that's what you're experiencing. That is just plain raw craving. You're writing a sentence and I want to get this sentence finished and I want to say exactly what I want to say in this. Well, that compulsive access, as, aspect of it that's craving. On the other hand, there is alongside of it something that is very healthy and very beautiful, which is the wholesome wish to express something uh, that can be useful in some way or of value. In this case, this sentence is so that, that you can communicate something to me and so that I can give you some advice in return. Once you let go of the craving to get the finish, to get the sentence done and over with, uh, then you can dwell in the place of the wholesome aspiration to communicate, not just for your own benefit, but for that of everyone else. I hope you can see this and understand it. I can see the aversion, I'm reading again, I can see the aversion in those subliminal attentions and I have to work with them. Yeah, but how do you work with them? You're not trying to squash them. That doesn't work. What you're trying to do is see them for what they really are. You say, oh, uh, all you have to do in order to cause the mind to generate less aversion is to say, to, is to be able to see crystal clear, oh, I'm doing this thing to myself, which hurts, which is uncomfortable, you know. Um, I mean, you, you grew up and became a, 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 a wise, sensible adolescent and then an adult by learning that there were some things that you did that actually made you miserable and you learn to not do them or you learn to find a better way and all you have to do is recognize that you know if you it's when you realize you're wearing a pair of shoes that are too tight and you buy yourself a new pair of shoes that's what this is all about uh, you know you you discover that ah aversion acting out of aversion only creates an illusion that i'm going to feel better uh, once I've once I've satisfied the aversion, once I've overcome it, it's uh, uh, whatever it is that I'm attributing it to, but the truth is the aversion is going to still be there. It's just going to change its object. So you recognize, oh, it's yeah. Let your unconscious mind remember what you never do anything. Your consciousness doesn't do anything. Read the fifth interlude. Get that really clear all your conscious experience does is provide information 
to the rest of your mind system, which is 99.9 something percent of your actual mind. Your mind system will take that information and say, wow, the more aversion that we generate, the more suffering we experience. How about let's not do so much of this in the future? There lies the solution to the problem. It's okay. So what would you suggest I do? Should I continue practicing in this manner or should I change my strategy? So I think you're referring back to your, your original strategy. Use that as necessary to gain the clarity, but you want to use that clarity not to avoid the feelings of suffering and aversion uh, and self-clinging that is founded in, but to recognize and hold that in awareness. The more you recognize and the more you hold that in your awareness, the more you investigate it with your attention, the more the rest of your mind system realizes it, that you, or you, that you keep repeating something that is just making you uncomfortable and unhappy. So I hope that is, <laughs> hope that helps you, Arda. I wish you were here and I wish that uh, I could get your feedback, but uh, love to hear anybody else's comments. <laughs> Was that at least useful to you? <laughs> yeah, so I, I think um, just to, to tie together the, the first um, uh, uh, Pablo's question and then this question, I, I, uh, what I've heard people ask quite often is they say, but when I do this kind of investigation of my experience, I'm taking my mind off the meditation object of the breath sensations. Mm -hmm. um, and so am I not actually interrupting my meditation by doing that when I'm on the cushion and I and I never know quite how to answer that because for myself the whole let it come let it be let it go worked really well and and so I I think perhaps I had a bit more of a natural knack for letting things go than than some people do um, and so I didn't spend as much time in investigative mode if you want to call it that yes could you perhaps speak to, to how, how um, you know, how, to, how one would answer that kind of inquiry? Yes. What <clears throat> you let it come, let it be, let it go in awareness until it reveals itself as something that is worthy of uh, focusing your attention on and you want to focus your attention on it in the mode, in the vipassana mode, in the seeing, not letting your mind, uh, not letting papancha develop out of this, not letting your mind fabricate stories and identify with it and everything else, but you're just directing your attention. The reason that you've been letting things come, letting them be and letting them go is to develop this stable attention that is the stable attention that is capable of uh, observing something objectively and seeing it for what it really is. So then when the opportunity comes up to use your attention in this way, like in uh, uh, Pablo's situation, and in artist situation and things like that, that's where you're actually using your attention for the purpose that you've been training it. And of course, your ability to do that and the effectiveness of that is going to increase and improve over time. And, but to the degree that you do that, to the degree that you focus, uh, you, you not only have stability of attention, but you have the Vipassana, you have the ability to see into or see see uh, see beyond the superficial appearances and get caught up in the analysis and all the confabulation that the mind tends to do with anything it focuses its attention on and just observe it mindfully. So that's the answer to that question is, is to discern. And part of that discernment, you see, 
to begin with, attention has been used to running free and doing whatever it wants and running the show. It has to give up that and it resists giving up that. So that's the training period. And it will be, it, it will be all the way till the effortness of stage eight until attention is completely, the, the parts of your mind system, the parts of your brain that uh, uh, underlie this tendency of attention to feel like it should be free to do whatever it wants and it should be in control to finally, to, uh, to, to finally let go of that and respond to the needs of the mind system as a whole. But from the very beginning, you're getting better and better at this. And so whenever, and usually it's at stage four, you begin having the opportunities to use your attention, uh, to use this attention that you're in the process of training. And of course, using it in that way is going to contribute to the training. Now the parts of your mind system associated with attention running free and doing whatever it wants they're starting to learn oh i am part of a really powerful tool that has never been used as effectively as it could be in the ways that can really alter uh my mind my life my relationship with others my understanding of reality right and so that's part of what makes your attention say okay yeah, let's get on with this training. Let me get better and better at doing this. Let me get better at this stability that's called samadhi. Let me get better at this clarity that's called vipassana. You know, and that our, actually makes sense in terms of stage four and seven being the ones where these things tend to come up because they mark particular uh, points at which the stability of the attention has increased significantly, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. The thing that doesn't across, come across in the stage paradigm that I borrowed from uh, uh, from the early writers of Buddhism is that the mind is a system. Let's take a systems approach to it, and let's realize that that as one part of the system progresses, then it's connected. It's part of us. It's only a part of a system it's bringing along other parts of the system with it and they have to have their chance to develop. So, you know, it's a whole system with feedback between all of its different parts. And that's why it's not as linear as the 10 stages. The 10 stages makes a good map for, makes a good developmental map. It's like we can compare it with the development of motor skills of an infant before they can walk to when they're able to do gymnastics. Okay, and that all of that sensory motor integration, it develops and from the outside, it looks linear. But if we were to look at it day to day, if we were to look at what's happening as a child first learns to stand or crawl, then to stand, then to walk, then to run, and then eventually goes through the process of learning how to successfully form, perform various gymnastic movements. We'll see there's all the different aspects of this, both sensory and motor, and they're working continuously to integrate. And that's really what the mind system is doing. It's a good, it's a good analogy. So the linearity is, from the overview, we see a linearity. When we get into what's actually happening, though, it's a systems process. It's interactive from all the different parts that contribute. So that's why, and, and you're seeing that. You're saying that, that yeah, at, at, at stage four, you're at a place where you can begin to use a part of the mind system that's been trained. And, and this is going to contribute to the further training and power of the in, in, entire mind system, right? That's the wonderful thing about it. And that is the role of a teacher when you've got a book that's, uh, uh, that is presenting information in a linear way. It is the nature of language it's the nature of the way we read books that this has to happen this way. But if and when I do a second edition of The Mind Illuminated, I'm going to emphasize much more thoroughly the systems aspect of that. And that, in fact, Juno, is the reason why I, I know you're aware of a few people that have actually achieved uh, the, all of the 
the, the, the stage 10 level of shamatha and have actually gone back and, be, and gone over from stage one again. And it's like they were uh, discovered all kinds of things by the time they get to stage 10 the second time. And some people, I know of one, one of my students who went through the entire sequence four times, learned new things at every, every time. Oh yeah, and that's why I, I reread the book from time to time because I always go, there's a sentence, it's right there talking about what I was struggling with. How did I not see it before? But exactly. of course, it's the different context in which you then, then see that it's new parts of your mind that are able to, to uh, link into that information. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I think is... the big thing I want to just ask you about this last, lastly is, um, so when those things come up, how do we recognize whether those are, are gross distractions rather than really important things to put our attention on? I think that's been something that's been asked to me a, a few times. Well, um, okay, that that discernment is something that is cultivated and you'll make mistakes. But yeah. <clears throat> um, what you're what you are looking for <clears throat> is if, if we look back at uh, what at the strategy that Arda developed, yeah. what it did is it put him in a more comfortable position, which opened up the opportunity to do something productive. But uh, he needed a little advice about how to use that because otherwise it was just a way of avoiding and it's it's no fault of artists it's typical of all of us that it's a learning process um at some point arda could have said to himself all right this is a way of dealing with the suffering and craving that just pervades all of my life but uh it's it's it only works for the, and he even said this in his question. He even he said, "But it only works when I'm doing it, and then I forget. I, I you know in my daily life I keep forgetting, and that's what tells you, okay, you know this is just a temporary solution. I'm just taking an aspirin for the headache. I'm not dealing with the cause of the headache. Right, right. And that's how we learn. That's one okay. of them. And then then I think the other one is sort of just very strong emotions coming up." Uh, are often a good indication of feelings in the body um, because it's not just a random thought about where you're going to spend your holiday or what shopping you have to do tomorrow. It you know, has a gravitas to it. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. I think that's uh, hopefully helpful to other people as well. But, uh, uh, yeah, I think that's an important thing you've covered there. One, one. Yeah, if you don't mind, I would like to ask a question also about this last part. Um, since I still didn't finish the book, maybe it's explained further in the book, but is there a point in the journey where this investigation of this either traumatic emotions or the suffering things, it becomes part of the formal practice or, um, it's something that we are supposed to be investigating, you know, we're supposed to be like getting away from the breath to investigate these things as they come along or I'm just wondering if there's like a formal, it's a, there's a moment where it's the part of the actual practice itself. Okay. There, the, the way there is a, <clears throat> what's described in stage four is a formal practice, but it's a formal practice that's appropriate to somebody who has not yet achieved the full development of Samadhi and Sati. Uh, and, uh, and vipassana. So by stage eight, you have that. Now what you're gonna find, as I say, uh, in your practice, you know, right, right through, there, there's going to be degrees of this and variations of this that happen all the way through the four paths. And the fourth path was just as far as the Buddha described. It's not the end of the process. There are further paths beyond that. Uh, once you reach that level of samadhi, sati, and vipassana that represents stage eight, um, then 
the fundamentals of what you're doing will be the same as the formal practice that's described in stage four for dealing with emotional content. But it's going to happen in a much easier and more natural way. You will be getting in touch with things that you couldn't have dealt with had they arisen earlier. But you're going to know, you're going to know from this cumulative experience uh, how how to deal with them. The biggest thing is recognition, and what I've learned is that life will give you the opportunity to recognize where uh, where you still need to do more work. And when it does, you'll have all of the skills necessary to, to do that work. It becomes much easier. Does that answer your question? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Well, I'm going to go ahead with the next question that you asked, Pablo. Sure. Okay. You recent, recently, I heard about the direct path, Ramana Maharshi, self-inquiry, non-duality. And this is creating some confusion because all these non-duality teachers like Rupert Spira make it seem as if there is no need to train the mind to reach the ultimate goal of awakening. And I'm losing motivation and clarity on why should I keep working on a progressive approach like TMI, even though I already experienced amazing benefits out of it. Can you please bring some clarity onto the relationship between the so-called direct path and progressive path? How do they integrate within the bigger picture of the awakening path? Why should we focus on one or the other? That is, uh, that's a very good question. And there are a variety of answers to, to that question um, because there are, there are so many ways that these ideas can be interpreted. Now, it is true that we already have the Buddha nature within us. And one form, uh, one, of the, one of the teachings that comes in the Kagyu tradition, it's called cleaning the jewel. That, that your practice is to recognize that, that you have the Buddha nature within you, the Tathagata Garbha, what that means is the embryonic Buddha within you. And the way that they describe that is that the uh, the crystal gem, the diamond, the diamond crystal of uh, the Buddha mind is already within each one of us. And of course that's true because nobody could ever achieve uh, a high degree of awakening if, if, if that wasn't already within them. So they describe this as cleaning, cleaning the jewel, cleaning the diamond, cleaning away the accretions uh, and that's what training the mind is, is cleaning away the accretions. Now, the, these direct path things, they, what I, my understanding of them from my own experience and being able to apply that experience to what I hear these teachers saying is that there, there is a way that you could, that you can recognize, that you, that you can get in touch with that Buddha nature and you can get in touch with the Buddha within in such a way that all of these accretions, all of these habits, all of these, this conditioned way uh, that, that uh, has its roots in our evolution, that has its roots in our developmentally throughout our life, it has its roots in our culture, that you can somehow, those will all magically fall away. And quite honestly, and I don't want to sound, I, I feel like every spiritual path is heading the same place. But from what I've seen, including with these teachers themselves, is that this is something that, that yes, it is possible to tap into. It is possible if you can come to understand and believe enough that you can have this experience. 
uh, in order to sustain that experience, you're still going to have to do a lot of work because that you're going to have that experience and you're going to lose that experience. The other possibility is you can have that experience and then you can put yourself in a situation where nothing ever arises that is going to disturb that. Okay. <laughs> so you could, you know, if you were in India and you suddenly became a revered saint and all of your needs were looked after and your only human interactions were those of encouraging people to recognize their own uh, incipient awakening that's just, you know, they're already awakened, but they don't know it, you know, and you, you might just be able to stay in that place without ever doing any of the other work on your life. Um, on the other hand, if you're living in the world, you're going to be falling in and out of this and you're going to be, you're going to, even though you may not uh, be talking to about this with your students, or you may be, some, some teachers of this are very open about this. The sudden, the entire sudden awakening school uh, historically has always taught that after sudden awakening, there is a lot more work to be done. So the only thing that really makes it different in my mind is, okay, you're finding a way to get in touch with your Buddha nature to be able to have that lived experience of what it's like to be an awakened being. And then that's going to motivate you to do the work uh, that you are still going to have to do. You, Brian, the, you know, your mind system is still what the only thing that what you refer to as you uh, has to work with. That mind system is just, it's just a part of everything else. It's a part of the, the wholeness of suchness. Um, and it is what it is because of its history. And it will become what it becomes because of what happens in each unfolding moment. So to have that experience of sudden awakening is a gift that can facilitate your, 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 what you do in each present moment and, and the future that, uh, that arises, the potential future that arises out of that. But I would go from the direct teachings of somebody like Rupert Spirit to the larger tradition of sudden awakening and recognize that, okay, what this is, is a very powerful way of awakening the student to the possibilities so that they can do the work that's necessary to sustain that. And that is explicitly acknowledged in every branch of the, of the sudden awakening tradition. Uh, and so, as I discovered that, I became much more comfortable with these, with, uh, with this particular teaching. And I don't think it would have persisted if it didn't have value. But I think it's unrealistic. Uh, basically, you can convince yourself that you're already awakened, but you're going to find you're still suffering, and you're going to find you're still causing suffering to others. So. Uh, sooner or later, you're going to have to ask yourself, what's wrong with this picture? Now, if you end up being a Ramana Maharshi, you may never discover that. Okay. That uh, if you're going to be a lay practitioner in the world, uh, then that sudden awakening is going to be a great gift, but you're still going to have to do the work. Yeah, it sounds like it's basically the same path, but just put putting the steps in a different order. Like everyone has to go through the kind of the purifying of the mind. It's just mm -hmm. they attempt to first understand your true nature to be able to have this. Yeah, like this. The, the understanding of where you're yeah. going from the very beginning. Um, but at the end of the day, they have to walk the same path in a way. Like it sounds like if you just had like a really nice trip on LSD and you felt like God. And then after that, you said, Oh, cool. Now I'm going to stick to meditation because I want to get, I want to sustain that state. sounds like something like that to me at this moment. 
That's exactly right. Because <laughs> I, I just never understood what do these people do in this kind of workshops with teachers like Rupert Spira. Like I see him, you know, talking a lot about this non-duality idea of just, just instead of focusing on the breath, just focus on the awareness itself. But then I'm like, cool. Like maybe after those four days of workshop, you get to get a slight sense of what it is like to be kind of enlightened. But how are you? Yeah, like I'm like, how are you supposed to sustain that? Like if life keeps throwing shit at you, like you what have do you to... do when you go home and your wife's yelling at you, or you <laughs> you go to work and your whole project falls apart, or, or you get fired? What what happens to it then? <laughs> Yeah, it's like you're not actually trained. You're not, your mind is not strong enough. It's not purified in a way that you can actually yeah. sustain that enlightened state. So, yeah, like now I actually make sense now that. Yeah. There's no way around um, the training itself. Like you have to go through the hard work, the hard and long work, basically. Right. That's right. Yeah. And a lot of what we call training involves untraining. You know, you, you've got to train yourself out of, you know, uh, living in your stories to coming from a place of understanding things from a much, from a place that's much more in touch with and in tune with the, the totality of the, of the wholeness of suchness that you are a manifestation of. So you've got to unlearn all all the you've got to unlearn the, all these habits that you've created. So it's just, uh, the the training involved a uh, you know a, a, an untraining as well. It's like somebody that taught themselves to play golf, but they're not very good at it, you know. And then they go to somebody who's an expert and they fine tune all these things, and then they get really good at it. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Well, that was that was good. That was great. Thank you so much. Um, now we have another question from Arda here. Um, said, uh, I'll be explaining my practice in more detail for this reason. First of all, due to TMI, I'm feeling a consistent sensation of pleasure on the sides of my head area. This has been going on every day to varying degrees for more than 12 months. I feel like this has become an easily accessible, joyful mental state as long as I'm mindful. I'm not sure which brain circuits are producing what chemicals, but what I know is that this completely eliminated severe and stable negative emotional mind states like depression, shyness, and anxiety. If I focus on it, I can maintain it with mindfulness. If I wing it, I can lose this pleasure, but the moment I direct my awareness towards my head, the pleasure reappears. I smile slightly to facilitate it. As a practice, I stabilize attention to the breath and expand the awareness to this joy, whole body and mind activities. Or I can direct the attention to the joy and expand the awareness to the body and mind, disregarding the breath and the process. I tend to direct the attention to the pleasure if I feel instability within it. Regardless, this enables me to practice effectively and develop metacognitive awareness. This was so effective that it radically transformed my life and my entire meditation practice. I feel like every micro movement one makes, oh, this is a continuation uh, of, of his earlier question or expansion of it, is filled with aversion and as long as uh, Metacognitive awareness and joy is present. Suffering is reduced. Let's see. So this is an elaboration of the question that we already answered. Um, but my resolve, I, I think where we get to something new is, as long as I've consciously intended to maintain this awareness in the morning, I can do it with consistent success. But my resolve is not always so high every single day. And sometimes subtle dullness, described in stage five, can appear. I never experience, experience so much sluggishness where I feel the need to go to sleep, but I can definitely feel this low-tier energy with joy where I'm not alert. 
comparing that mental state with how my mind feels increased energy and then playing video games makes me realize the problem of this subtle dullness. But while playing video games, the downside of that is I tend to lose or feel a sense of diminishing in the mindfulness, joy, body awareness, and introspective awareness. Even though joy definitely gives me energy, I'm still trying to bridge the gap between the quality of energy I feel in daily life with a quality of alertness in formal sitting meditation. What would you suggest I do? And then he goes on with the rest of what he asked before. So this is an expansion of that. And so um, it seems to be very much a theme of what we're talking about today. So as I discuss in a fair bit of detail in uh, uh, the chapter on stage five, uh, there is a degree of sustained subtle dullness, which is associated with pleasure, and which is one of the many ways that the mind can find to um, escape the basic samsaric cycle, which is going on over and over again. Uh, moment by moment, minute by minute, hour by hour, uh, as you move into each new situation during the day, as you wake up to a new day each morning, you know, as your life moves through its different phases, this cycle, the samsaric cycle keeps, keeps happening. The, the story of I is reborn and with the rebirth of the story of I is a whole new set of uh, ancillary stories that that sustain that and that uh, proliferate from that. And then the, the attachment brings new forms of craving and out of that craving comes the suffering. And uh, till eventually, you know, the the, uh, the cycle reaches some kind of a climax uh, that we could say we could say is effectively that uh, there's a version let's let's take a situation that you're in in daily life. You enter that situation and if you're familiar with the links of dependent arising, then you can actually observe your own, the, the, the birth of the eye and the whole process, the cyclic process of each new piece of information comes in, it goes through these processes of, uh, uh, of uh, contact, feeling, craving, uh, reification and, and uh, attachment of upadana, then the, the becoming of you know, you, you create your reality and out of that comes an intention and an action and then there's, and that's the moment of rebirth and then you return, then that produces consequences and those consequences start the next stage of the cycle. But you see that all of these little cycles in that situation that you're in uh, add up to one big cycle where the, it's going to reach the, eventually it's going to reach some kind of climax and you're going that's that situation is going to end and you're going to enter a new one and the whole process is going to repeat itself so we can dedicate our lives to trying to avoid the suffering that arises out of the repetition of this process we could do something like inject heroin into our veins several times a day and uh, and minimize the degree of suffering but uh, we're the end result is that uh, that the whole such samsaric situation is driving this thing just gets worse and worse and worse. There are uncountable ways people can pursue power and wealth, and every time they make another successful gambit for more money or more power, uh, they have this feeling of they they they've escaped from the the they, they enjoy the. They, they, the, the joy of the success and the, 
and the uh, ending of the craving and the suffering that was driving them, but it only lasts for a very short time. And if they were to look at it closely, uh, a lot of that, that joy and satisfaction that they get would be an illusion because some part of their mind already knows that, that that's going to pass too. And so what we have to be aware of is that the mind will always be seeking a way to escape from the dukkha of the moment. And unfortunately, a lot of these ways are ways that at the very best are only a, a temporary alleviation of the dukkha of the moment. And in the worst case, they are setting the foundations for even greater dukkha in the future. So this is, this is, this describes the human condition. We pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. We start with who we are and where we are. And we begin to take the, we begin to discern the wholesome sources of satisfaction uh, reduction of suffering, reduction of, of craving, uh, reduction of self-clinging as, as we become wiser and wiser. Uh, we begin to discern the difference between those and the temporary escapes. So sustained subtle dullness can lead a person to where they have these joyful meditations, they arise in a state of dullness, they go through uh, for a little while in sort of this uh, blissful post-meditative state of, you know, they basically blanked out most of the sources of suffering, but then sooner or later it just all comes back again. And like I say, it's no different than, uh, you know, it's, it's wonderful, Arda, that you've used the example of computer games here, because, you know, in the fifth of the traditional precepts, the Buddha says it refers to the use of alcohol. In the way that I use this for people taking precepts from me is to avoid anything that dulls the mind. And that would include computer games. That would include surfing the net. That would include engaging in social media and things like that. Not that you can't do any of these things mindfully, but that uh, and not that you can't use, for example, a, an opiate painkiller uh, wisely and appropriately. But the thing is that mostly what these are is just, they're, they're serving the same purpose as alcohol. They're dulling the pain of life, right? They're creating uh, a, a temporary and not very genuine kind of joy and happiness uh, but, but they're not dealing with the real problem. So as I was saying in my previous answer to Arda, is that he has the awareness, he has the understanding. He needs to cultivate the discernment to, so that he escapes the trap of discovering how he can use unification of mind and awareness and things like this to temporarily interrupt the this this cycle of of self clinging craving and and dukkha uh, and then it the the seeming satisfaction that is really just a subtler form of dukkha that arises out of that. And then the whole process that that in itself leads to more self clinging, which guarantees more craving and so on and so forth. The solution, the ultimate solution of the problem is seeing through this cycle that I just described and recognizing how to undo it. And uh, so, one of the many, there are many ways to undo it. Doing this training is a way to undo it. Um, looking, what I would suggest to Arda in particular here, uh, I was, the moment that I read that sentence, uh, I don't know if I can find it because it's a very long paragraph that he wrote here, 
but he says, oh, as long as, I found it, as long as I've consciously intended to maintain awareness in the morning, I can do it with consistent success. So Arda, what I would like you to do is to add to that the mindful review at the end of your day so that you look back and reflect and you bring a kind of clarity of discernment that you may not have had throughout the day and you bring that to bear on the events of the day to give you that enhanced understanding and appreciation uh, that allows you to be more discerning the next morning when you get up and you and you uh, form that resolve. You say, but my resolve is not always so high every single day. And that's fine. On the days that on the days that that happens, that gives you the opportunity. If you did the mindful review at the end of the day, that gives you the opportunity to see very clearly what was different, what happened. And from that, and holding that in your consciousness, and the more you just exercise vipassana, the more that you just examine that, you don't analyze it, you don't tell stories about it, you just examine that and you let that truth seep into your unconscious, then, then your mind system is going to move in the direction so that with each succeeding day, when a similar situation arises, your response is going to be more refined, there's going to be more discernment. You're not going to exercise the joy that arises out of the uh, unification of mind as a way to avoid the suffering. Instead, you're going to use it as a way to more deeply understand suffering and the causes of suffering. And I, I wish you were here, Arda, and I look forward to hearing from you that, that um, you know, you can, you can see this. Is, this is, when you get right down to this, this is very recursive. It's a process that begins with your first day of meditation. And it just becomes, you become more capable. It becomes, the, the, the process becomes more deep and more profound uh, as you go along. And so you go from the initial stabilizing and uh, the initial results of training your mind is that you, you become a little more happy during your daily life and you, uh, you're easy, you're, you're not as reactive and you can deal with the stress more readily and things like that till what you're looking for is the version of that that comes much further along where where it's no longer a, a question of uh, of dealing with your own stress more effectively and being less reactive to being to being able to deal with the stress of the world and being part of it and still maintaining in yourself a place of equanimity and joy that comes from understanding things as they really are and there is no longer any resistance to what happens. There is the recognition that you need to care for this body. There's the recognition that, that your mind represents a point of view on the, on the wholeness of, of, of whatever the ultimate is. Uh, and you, you dance with this wholeness with this ultimate. You participate in the dance and you participate joyfully. But you're no longer you're, you're, you're no longer the suffering being cycling through over and over and over again uh, the way you once were. 
you'll still have your cycles. You'll still continue to grow. And you'll still attain deeper and deeper uh, wisdom. You'll still, uh, you know, just when you think, wow, I guess, I guess I've arrived, a new door of, of understanding will open. And you'll see that there's a whole new path lying in front of you that, you know, as the Buddha said, uh, one sutta, he says, what I've taught you, and this would include the four paths, what I've taught you is like the dirt under my fingernails compared to the earth. And another one, he says, what I've taught you, including the four paths, including what he taught about awakening, is like this handful of leaves compared to all the leaves in the forest, you know. That fourth path is a path, and you'll never stop learning. You'll come to a place where you wouldn't want to, because as the cliche says, it's not the destination, it's the journey. That, that is why this human existence is such an incredible gift, because throughout this existence as an individual human being, not a self, just a manifestation of wholeness in the form of this individual human being, this particular point of view in the totality of suchness, you have this wonderful opportunity. You are, you are all, how ultimate reality goes about experiencing itself. So, So yes, Ramana Maharshi, Rupert Spira, you already you are this is what you already are. It's just realizing what you already are. But there are systematic ways, there are a variety of systematic ways. Uh, some are better for some people than others. Some work better because they involve a deeper understanding than others. Uh, some approaches of suit different kinds of persons. Uh, some people, you know, uh, 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 the approach that produces someone who is, say, a scientist, for example, won't be necessarily the best approach for somebody who is a very creative artist, you know, but uh, we're all, we're, we're all already a manifestation of the ultimate. And uh, it's a question of finding finding the best way to reach that, and uh, there are, there are many places that we can get stuck along the way. That we, little side tracks that we can get on, and but the earlier we learn the skills of discernment, and the more we keep practicing those, then the less time we will spend in these little byways. So. You know, imagine that you're an explorer in South America, in the jungles, trying to find the headwaters of the Amazon. And you go a particular way until you realize, okay, this is taking me farther from where I'm trying to go. And you go back and you rediscover the path and you, 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 you get a little closer and then you might make another little wrong turn along the way. But it's the journey. It's not the destination. Because the you uh, as another beautiful cliche goes, only God, only the mind of God, uh, only God can know the mind of God, right? Only the totality of suchness, only the ultimate itself, can know it in its fullness. But we, as human beings, can devote our lives to to approaching that as much as we can. And every step will be filled with wonder and beauty. And getting beyond our own is one of the earlier stages of this wonderful, glorious adventure that life it potentially is. So don't let yourself be fooled by things that temporarily allay your suffering. The Buddha laid it out in his very, in 
what is purported to be his very first teaching where he gave the Four Noble Truths. And after that, when people said, what do you teach? He says, suffering and the nature of suffering. So you can go beyond that. It's where you have to start because suffering and the things that cause suffering are what drive us. That's where we have to learn. But it's a journey that only gets better the further you go. And what temporarily alleviates your suffering is not necessarily bad. It's just bad if you get stuck there. Instead, it's good. It's good if it gives you the opportunity to see more clearly and to see more deeply, uh, to move to move farther along this great, wonderful path that we're on, to continue your journey. So I think I'll leave you with that. <laughs> Unless anybody has a question that they'd like to, uh, anything that's pressing that they would like to bring up now. Uh, Hi, Kiladasa. There was uh, one more question by Arda about uh, Nurata Samadhi. Oh, there was. Yes, you're right. Okay. Yes, let me deal with that. So, uh, what is, first he calls it Nurota Samadhi. Uh, and I know what he means. It's Nurota Samapati is what it is. And Niroda is, uh, it is, uh, it is, it, it, it is a, uh, okay, it, it is, the word means uh, the, the, the cessation, it's a cessation. And Samapati is a dwelling in the cessation. Now the Naroda Samapati is something that's sometimes described as the ninth jhana after the uh, after the fourth formless jhana, uh, the uh, the jhana of neither perception nor non-perception, and the form it takes is uh, the way it's described. I have never practiced this, although not very long ago I realized I, I know exactly how. And at some point, uh, when it's appropriate, I'm, I'm going to practice this just so that I know more about it. But this is the way it's described. This is where the, this, first of all, in terms of nirvanas, they say there is a nirvana with a remainder and a nirvana without remainder, okay? All of the other nirvanas, the cessation that, uh, often arises in association with various path attainments. The cessation of craving, which is uh, one, def one kind of nirvana. Uh, the cessation of self-clinging, which is a closely related and more powerful form of nirvana. These are all nirvanas with remainder. There are two nirvanas without remainder. One is the the uh, pari nirvana or pari nirvana of death, okay, with the this dissolution of the body at death, is a pari nirvana without remainder, and the other pari nirvana without remainder is naroda samapati. Now it is said that this can only be achieved by uh, an advanced third path practitioner or by a fourth path practitioner, an arhat. And it's further said that if a third path practitioner achieves Naroda Samapati, that they arise uh, from that Naroda Samapati as an arhat. Okay, this is what it says in the commentaries. You don't find this in the suttas. Now, the Naroda Samapati itself is described as usually lasting seven days. And you have to remember seven days is sort of a metaphorical number. It means, uh, it, it could mean three or four, or it could be 10 or 15 or something like that. 
it's, uh, it, but it, it lasts, so that's what saying that it lasts seven days means. They say that the body is in a state like death except for a subtle warmth. In other words, the uh, body temperature falls, body metabolism basically falls, uh, the brain doesn't show, uh, I mean, they didn't have EEGs back in the days when uh, the commentaries were written and things like this. But there is a complete cessation of all mental activity in this Naroda Samapati. And I very strongly suspect that this is exactly the state that those yogis have been in. There's, there are, if you ever look into it, there are a number of very carefully documented cases of yogis who were able to be buried underground for a week at a time and then we would be dug up again and they would uh, wake up and still be alive. So I think, believe this is the same state that they're, that they're talking about as Naroda Samapati. Um, so yes, there's no perceptible breathing. As a matter of fact, all signs of life are gone except the body does not become cold and rigid with rigor mortis as it would in actual death. And at the end of the Naroda Samapati, the person comes back to life. Now, the reason that I've never practiced this is I, and even the commentaries support this, is that the only value that has ever been described for it is if you're already an advanced third path practitioner and you do Naroda Samapati, that you would arise from that as an arhat, as a fourth path practitioner. Uh, I've never heard any other uh, reason for why somebody would do this and what purpose it would serve. It makes a great stunt. I have heard of a monk who, in the midst of a major celebration, in, uh, it was either in Burma or Thailand, I can't remember what, on a street corner went into Naroda Samapati and there were parades and there were people singing and there was all the stuff that would go on the, during a multi-day uh, ceremony. And he, he, he sat uh, virtually like he was dead throughout all of this. And then a uh, day or so afterwards, he arose from this. What one would gain from that, I don't know. Um, I have, as I say, I've never seen, uh, for years and years that I've known about this, I've never seen any particular reason or value in practicing it. Um, but since I had the experience a few months ago of discovering that, I, ah, I know exactly how to do that. And I've since thought that at an appropriate time, just so that I would be able to answer questions like this more knowledgeably, uh, I would go ahead, I will go ahead and uh, uh, practice Naroda Samapati just, just, to, just so that I know more about it. And that is an intention of mine, and that's the reason for doing it. Now, one of the things that I find very interesting is in modern Western internet discussion group Buddhism, um, an aspect of which is often referred to as pragmatic Buddhism, uh, another aspect of which is often described as secular Buddhism, they take this term Naroda Samapati, and people who you can obviously tell by reading their posts are not at a third path level of development, are claiming that they practice Naroda Samapati. And I think I just make a wild guess, but that's probably the source of Arda's question as he's heard about this from people and he's probably heard about people who are claiming to be able to practice Naroda Samapati. Um, but I haven't read on any internet forum, uh, not that I spend very much time uh, looking at those things anyway. It's usually only when somebody draws my attention to something, a particular 
uh, post or a particular thread that I will go to them. But I have had occasion to read some threads of people who are claiming to have practiced Naroda Samapati. And then what I read, what I read leads me to believe that uh, I'm not sure what they're doing. Sometimes it's obvious what they're doing. Sometimes, sometimes I can't tell what they're doing. But what I can say is based on the commentarial description in detail of Naroda Samapati that that isn't what they are doing. So that's all I can really say about that. But uh, from my point of view, I don't know the value of it. One of these days, I'm going to try it out just to see. And um, uh, I don't recommend that, uh, I mean, since the commentaries say it's, it's something that you can only accomplish from third path or fourth path, and since the only value that's mentioned in it is that uh, uh, is uh, that you can attain fourth path from third path. Actually, let me take it back. When I say it's never mentioned in the suttas, there is one thing that I think might refer to that. The Buddha and a teacher from some other tradition are having a discussion and um, you know, this other teacher is claiming, I've gone into such a deep meditation that I don't remember what it was. Some, some incredible thing happened uh, and uh, it didn't disturb his meditation. He didn't come out of meditation. And the Buddha responds, well, you know, I said, that's nothing. I went into meditation once and a whole herd of wild elephants uh, uh, ran through and it didn't disturbed my meditation. And so that sounds like that sounds like a reference to Naroda Samapati, but um, there's never anything I've come across in the suttas that really dealt with it uh, or recommended it or described the practice of it. Please do, oh, sorry. No, no, please go ahead. Okay. Okay. Please do inform us, do tell us when you try it out. Oh, I will let people know for sure. Yeah, I promise. Thanks. <laughs> uh, I might just ask, uh, ask uh, for purely intellectual curiosity, when you say it's uh, in the commentaries, um, where, would, where would one read? Is it Vasudhi Maga or where would one read that? Um, I, I, that is one of the problems that I have had all my life you know, is that I can't always remember where where I saw these things. Well, I'm the same, and I'm half your age, so I and I know what it's like. I, I can't remember things like I used to ten years ago. So, <laughs> <laughs> right, but it is something that you know. If you were to do a sophisticated Google search, I'm sure that you would find references that would. Uh, put you on the trail to finding those. Just you know, just because these are these are fascinating things that people do talk about, um, and things like that, and the um, the past life practices that that you used to do. Where did you learn about about those? Are those things that have been written about, um, or uh, would you say that's something that one can only learn with a teacher? Yes, so there are a lot of things like that, and. We could talk about all of those too. I, I've done the past life practices. I, you yeah. probably heard me talk about. I've heard you talk about them. I've I've never heard you explain where you read about the actual methods of of doing them. And it's again uh, purely intellectual curiosity. Yeah. Well, sometime uh, this forum or elsewhere. Sometime let's talk about let's talk about that. Uh, there's there's a few different ways that you can practice them. And the way that that I was actually taught was, or when I was learning jhana practice is uh, it's something that you can do from, there's, there's several interesting practices you can do from the fourth jhana, from, from the, uh, uh, yeah. And, well, I think what I'll do then in the future is I will put up a question saying, let's talk about some of these sort of more esoteric things that maybe don't have any direct uh, 
value in terms of sure that sounds wonderful yeah yeah i think that would be a, a fun discussion to have sometime thank you let's plan on it then all right okay next time <laughs> thanks uh, well i'm all talked out so <laughs> Thanks and very much. I have other things to do this morning, so or the afternoon, or wherever you are, whatever time zone. So thank you. I enjoyed this, and look forward to uh, our next meeting, which will be in a couple of weeks. So take care. Until then, be thank well, so safe. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe. Practice diligently. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.